So uh, please let me introduce, first of all, Dennis Meadows. Dennis, you have the floor. And uh, you have almost half an hour. Please. Today, we come to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the publication of Limits to Growth. The first presentation was, of the book was March 1972, but actually a more important meeting was 42 years ago. Uh, in December 1970, I made a first presentation of our ideas about the book at a Club of Rome meeting in Montebello, Canada. And I still remember how uh, I felt after the meeting because I wanted to present our research and the Club of Rome members kept stopping with questions about what do you mean exponential growth? What do you mean limits? Don't you think technology will be a tool? What about delays and so forth? And so after the meeting, I, we went back uh, to Cambridge and I said to Donella, you know, it's just not acceptable that we have to spend all of our time on these basic ideas, so maybe you could make a little dictionary and we can send this out to everybody. And in the dictionary will be defined exponential growth and limits and so forth. So she did it. And of course, she was a brilliant, brilliant writer. So it was an excellent little 12-page uh, uh, book. We sent it to the club, everyone, and back came many criticisms, questions, comments. So I said, okay, can't be 12 pages, has to be 25 pages. So she wrote the 25-page definitions, and we sent it out. And the Club of Rome members, they came back with so many questions and criticisms and other issues. So I said, okay, not 25 page, has to be 100 page. And uh, that she did. And finally, we had a book. Uh, not the book which the Club of Rome wanted, wanted us to write, but it was the book that Aurelio wanted, for sure. And then uh, we had to publish it. We had to find somehow a publisher because we didn't have any money to publish this book. And we, I found a group I knew in Washington. And they said, OK, but what do we call it? And I said, well. Uh, let's say, limits to growth, a global challenge. And the publisher said, you know, everything is a global challenge. Let's just call it limits to growth. And so that's how uh, the book came. Now it's 40 years later. Interesting question. What, uh, what do we know now that we didn't know back then? Here's what I'm going to talk about today. So in 1972, there were two possible paths for global society. One we might call overshoot, and another one we might call sustainable development. If we didn't change, we would get overshoot. If we did change, we could have sustainable development. We didn't change, so we got overshoot. Because now we are in overshoot, the idea of sustainable development is really no longer useful to us. It doesn't lead to useful action. We need something different. So we have to change our focus in two ways. Uh, first, we have to focus on universal, not global problems. I'll define the difference. And also, we have to focus on resilience, I think, not sustainability. Incidentally, these slides are on the central bank computer, so you shouldn't write anything down. It's uh, available to you if you want it. And the important thing, I think the Club of Rome can have a major new life and a major new impact in the 21st century if it would make this change. It isn't possible to predict the future, but in 1972, we could see two different general possibilities, uh, so-called standard run or overshoot and so-called stabilized world or sustainable development. Notice that in 1972, we were here. And actually, even in 72, we still expected that there would be another 40 years of growth. 
So the first speaker said our, all of our predictions didn't come true. And I said, yet, because we aren't at that point. You see, we were here in 72, and we expected things would continue. Now it's, 19, it's 2012, just here. And the first curves in that model start to turn over uh, food. We could have had this one, but now it's not available to us anymore because we didn't change. You see it, population. Here is where the book came out in 1972. It said we have to slow down population growth. You see we had enormous impact on uh, global policy. Nothing. We said you had to slow down uh, metals and industrial growth. Again, here we were in 72, and you can see it. No impact. We didn't, didn't change. Uh, so the consequence of that is that now the globe has moved into overshoot. We are above long-term possibilities. It's a very difficult concept to discuss. Uh, it involves many different issues, but one scientist, a Swiss scientist, has developed a rather good technique for understanding this. Uh, that's Matas Fakernagel, who uh, created this concept, global ecological footprint. And it's the idea that it's possible forever to have a footprint of one, but if you go above, uh, you, it will come back down. In 1972, we were here about 0.9. Now we are up at about 1.6 and growing faster and faster. You may ask, how can you be above the limit? It's, any banker understands that if people put a lot of money in the bank, then for a short period, they can take out more than they put in. And that's what we're doing. Millions of years, we saved up forests and soil and water and so forth. And now, over a few decades, a century, we take them back down very quick. Recently, in Australia, uh, the National Scientific Group, CSIRO, asked, so after 40 years, what do we see about limits to growth? They took global data and compared it to our two runs. This is their result. These are five variables from our model, population, industrial output, non-renewable resources, and pollution. And you see two curves. Sustainable development curve, the blue, and the overshoot, which is the green. And the purple dots are the empirical data from the real world. So what we can say is so far, we're tracking just exactly on the overshoot path. But I mean, if you read the papers, it becomes very clear that's true. Now, of course, there have been criticisms about this. You heard them yourself. In the 70s, they, they said, well, there really are no limits. In the 80s, it became clear there are some limits. So they said, well, maybe there are limits, but they are very far away. We don't have to worry about them. In the 90s, we started to see the limits weren't so far away. And then they said, well, don't worry. Technology and the markets, they will take care of these problems for us. Now, in the first decade of the, this century, it's, we see with many different crises that technology in the market don't automatically take care of these problems. So they say, well, we just need to have more growth. If we have more growth, that gives us the resources we need to deal with these problems. But this idea of more growth now has two mistakes. Uh, the first mistake is shown here. This is empirical data on so-called natural disasters. This is uh, data compiled from a Belgian institute. You see, with growth, you cause problems which are more costly than the resources you get. So you are just moving backwards. You try to get more resources, but in the process, you create so many problems that it costs you even more to fix them than the extra that you got. You know, interesting question. Between 1990 and 2005, 15 years, the world had the best growth it ever saw in human history. And yet the problems got worse. 
Now somehow we're supposed to have a little more growth and suddenly the problems will get better? I don't think so. The second uh, mistake which is made is uh, to imagine that the economic system is trying to solve these problems. The economic system globally is, of course, many things happen which are useful, but globally the economic system has really moved in a very different direction. I can show you a couple uh, slides. In the international markets, there's a foreign currency exchange. You trade lei for euro, euro for yen, yen for uh, other currencies. In 1975, 70% of those transactions were done to facilitate trade. Uh, you live in Romania, you want to buy a Mercedes-Benz, so you have to trade your local currency for uh, German currency in order to buy the car. That was to facilitate trade. Now, 3% is done for foreign trade. 97% is done for gambling, to make money, hoping to buy low and sell high. And the volume on the international foreign exchange markets is huge. 14 times the annual global GDP. The amount of money which is traded on foreign exchange markets in a year is 14 times, one four times bigger than the total global GDP from all countries. And only 3% is for trade and 97%. So that's one mistake to imagine that somehow the economic system is trying to solve problems. It's not. It's, much of it is trying to make money. And you see it also with stock. You know, the traditional way is you buy stock in a company, hoping the company can build up. In 1975, the average time that someone held stock after buying it, seven years. Now, less than seven minutes. With flash trading, some stock is held even microseconds. This is no longer an economy which is trying to solve problems. It's a casino. You see this also with debt. Uh, there's, of course, much discussion about the euro crisis these days. This is what's behind the euro crisis. Target two are the balances held by central financial authorities to facilitate trade between the different countries within the eurozone. A lot of discussion now about Greece. Actually, Greece's deficit isn't very big. Uh, Spain's is probably something like five times bigger. And uh, here is Italy. Germany, of course, has huge positive, uh, something like 750 billion euro. This is why Merkel suddenly changed her mind about bailing out the euro. If the euro goes away, 750 billion dollar, or euros of assets currently used by banks, insurance companies, and other institutions inside Germany to show how rich they are, disappear. If you take 750 billion euros of assets out of Germany, that's going to really cause a lot of political problems. And so Merkel doesn't want that to happen between now and the next election. So therefore you see it. But of course it's not only the Eurozone. Same thing in the United States. Uh, actually we have bigger debts than anybody in the Eurozone. Uh, this is gross public debt. It's uh, 14 trillion uh, back here and now it's up around uh, 16 or 18 and we just announced new policies which will continue to take it up. So you see the economic system isn't, when it's operating like this, isn't something which anymore is solving our problems for us. Now, in this context, we start to think about this goal of sustainable development. Of course, we all know the Brundtland definition, but if you see how people are using the term these days, there are some other assumptions. Here are some common assumptions. Nobody says this, but this is what they mean. So first of all, if we're going to have sustainable development, the rich can keep what they have. 
and uh, maybe even, hopefully, get a little bit more. You never hear about Americans or Germans praising sustainable development, thinking somehow they have to go down. But they say it's only fair that the poor should come up. So the second assumption is the poor will also come up to where we are. Uh, and of course, we don't have to make any big changes. We'll do this inside the current economic and political system. How? Oh, there's the magic. Decoupling. We're going to create new t technologies that decouple GDP growth from use of energy and materials. So you see, it will be magic. GDP goes up, and suddenly energy and materials start to go down. And plus, everybody starts to be in favor of equity, so that we all have the same. Uh, there is no scientific evidence to show the possibility of absolute decoupling. Many economists have been looking around through the data to show how this is possible. They don't find the data. There's relative decoupling. You can use energy and materials a little bit more efficiently so that it doesn't go up quite as fast as the GDP, but we never see where it goes down and the GDP goes up. Okay. So I think if you understand what people really mean by sustainable development, it's a fantasy. It, it, it has no realistic basis. It's politically appealing. Every politician likes to stand up and say they're in favor of sustainable development. Of course, what they mean is we get to keep what we have, the poor get to come up, and so, and so forth. The Club of Rome, I think, and other organizations needs to quit this idea that they are going to achieve sustainable development. It's not, uh, it's not a realistic idea. Instead, we need to start worrying about the problems we face. So let me just give two examples, climate change and energy. These are very familiar to you, so I don't go into detail. Uh, here is a graph generated by a computer which shows precipitation rainfall patterns in the period 2030 to 2040. So only 15 years from now. The red is drought. You know, it's no accident that in the United States today, 83% of the country is in drought conditions. And also here in this region, also you start to see drought. The important point is if we stopped today generating all greenhouse gases, still we get this. We don't anymore have the possibility to avoid this. It may be a little worse, it may be a little better. Of course, the map itself is uncertain because it's generated on the basis of assumptions and so forth. But generally speaking, this is what's coming. I used this first in Russia. I was in Moscow for two weeks in uh, May. I was trying to get them to be worried about climate change. And I said, you know, you have two choices. You can start to worry about climate change or you can start to learn Chinese. Because this region produces 65% of the grain of China. And this region, where there's lots of rainfall, is almost empty. But this is China, and that's Russia. So obviously, the Chinese are going to move north. But then I looked. Mexico is also becoming difficult. So I start now to learn Spanish. The point is, this is coming. So we now have two, uh, two choices. We can get ready for it, or we can pretend somehow we're going to solve these problems. Climate change is many other things, not only drought. It's uh, heat waves. I mean, you know, fantastic to be in Bucharest in October with 30 degrees. But uh, this is not normal, and it starts to have a very serious influence on your agriculture. Sea level rise. Not a big problem here, uh, so much. Uh, food production declines. With every degree increased temperature, bio 
synthetic capacity goes down about 10 percent. Crops have evolved to be optimized under the current system. So, of course, when the temperature starts to go up, food production starts to go down. Uh, diseases start to migrate. Even in my, where my home is, I now have to worry about certain diseases which never were in that area before because the uh, insects are migrating. Uh, start to get acidic oceans, which has enormous consequences for the ecosystems. Uh, they used to think that the Arctic ice would melt by the end of the century. Now it seems it's going to melt in the next few years. Glaciers disappear. Uh, for tourists, it means you don't have such pretty pictures, but for many people, the glaciers are the source of water which sustains rivers through the long summer session. For them, serious problem. And forests start to burn. Areas no longer can support forests. The forests are going to go away. The way forests go away is that they burn. In the United States, we are dealing now with this issue. We think each forest fire is somehow a unique event, and we have to stop and to make it normal. But the normal is that they're going to go away. Also, energy. The, in 19, so this is a map of energy discoveries, oil discoveries, and oil use globally. Important for you because of Romania has and is a very important oil company. In 1984, for the first time, global oil use became bigger than global oil discovery. And never again since 1984 did we find as much oil as we used. We are using these reserves, which we discovered and didn't use in the old days. Recently, we discovered about 5 billion barrels and used 31 billion barrels. So you see it's starting to be quite a big imbalance. The result of this is that oil production will go down, and when it goes down, important parts of the energy sector will start to go back down again. People already realize this. Economists and politicians don't like to talk about it, but the military has been a very important source of study because uh, they understand you can't run tanks and ships and planes using windmills or photovoltaic panels. So in the United States, in Germany, in England that I know of, the military has started to analyze the long-term consequences. And in the United States, the U.S. Navy is now engaged in a very serious program to convert all its engines to biofuel. I think it's a stupid idea, but it shows that they are really serious about it. And Science Magazine, which is the most important science publication in the United States, recently had a big article, Peak Oil Production May Already Be Here. So this isn't something far away. The best estimate is that oil production will decline by 50 percent between now and 2030. Oil is only one-third of total energy, but it's practically the entire transport sector and crucial for producing fertilizer and pesticides and so forth. Another problem we don't talk about is the declining energy return on investment. It's not a question of how many barrels you take out of the ground. It's a question of how much useful energy you take out of the ground. If you have to spend 12 barrels of energy to get 10 barrels back, you don't have anything left over, and you can't run a modern industrial society on that. In the old days, the return on investment was 100 to 1. You use one barrel of oil, and you get back 100. Now, in the United States, it's about 15. And for alternative sources, windmills and such things, it can be three, four, five, eight. So we just are moving into a different period. What to do about that? Well, I would say, at least uh, for groups like the club, forget about <clears throat> global problems and start to focus on universal problems. Global problems affect everyone, 
like climate change, nuclear weapons, epidemics, but you only solve these problems if everybody works together. You can't solve climate change in Bucharest if they don't solve it in Beijing, Ankara, New York, and so forth. And the problem with these problems is that usually if you want to take action, you pay now here, and the benefits come later over there. And this is not a very attractive uh, political platform. Universal problems give a different possibility. They affect everybody, but like air pollution, soil erosion, flooding, uh, deforestation, you can solve them here for you without worrying about Beijing or Ankara solving for them. And the benefits are, if you work on universal problems, you pay here now, and the benefits come here soon. This starts to be a more attractive uh, possibility for politicians. The Club of Rome has a very wide system of national associations, each in their own country. They could start to become very effective with the universal problems. And the second way we have to change is to quit imagining we're going to get sustainability and start seeking resilience. It's moving from sustainable development to survivable development. Resilience is the ability to absorb a shock and to keep giving essential functions. So for example, in Fukushima, uh, the resilient cities were rather quick able to start giving, again, food and water to their people. Uh, the ones that which didn't do it were not resilient. We say they were brittle. This is interesting because political and economic pressures tend to give increased efficiency maximizing short-term profit. The result is to reduce long-term resilience. So we systematically move in the direction of increasing short-term efficiency, which is very attractive, but it reduces resilience. Uh, the Japanese saw this when they found that just-in-time manufacturing, which is extremely efficient, was also very brittle. One small factory producing one important car part in the Fukushima area, suddenly was destroyed, and cars all over the, the world couldn't be produced until substitutes were found. Or one factory which produced computer hard drives in Bangkok went under the floods. Suddenly, it became difficult to build computers everywhere in the world. Efficient, but brittle. There are ways to increase resilience. I won't explain these, except to say that they can be applied at the individual level, company level, university level, NGO, city, country, also the globe. At each level, it's possible to find ways to take these five measures. Uh, and if you do that, then I think you have a platform for change. Now the Club of Rome asks the associations for help. The Club of Rome could start to offer the associations help, how to strengthen the associations around the world. Now the club basically is focusing on global problems. I think it would be more effective if it focuses on the universal problems. Now it's seeking sustainable development. I think it should focus on resilience. Our problem now is to create a system which can come through this period and not lose its essential values. And if that happened, I think a lot of people would understand that the Club of Rome was starting to do something unique in the world and it would attract a lot of funding. Thank you. Dennis, thank you very much.